Hi, my name is Rod Cleef, and I'm the host of the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. And every week I interview multifamily rock stars, and we talk about how they've built incredible wealth for themselves and their families through multifamily properties. So hit the like and subscribe buttons to get notified every Monday when a new episode comes out. Let's get to it. Welcome to another edition of Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I am thrilled you're here. And I know you're going to get tremendous value from the two young gentlemen I'm interviewing today. Uh, their names are Cody Davis and Christian Osgood, and uh, they're in Washington State. Uh, they're in about 110 doors, uh, multifamily, uh, and plus another 12 under contract. But almost all of those were done with seller financing, including a resort that they own was done with seller financing. So we're definitely going to dig into that because that's not something we talk about much on the show. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Welcome to the show, guys. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, good to see you. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you guys. And uh, let's uh, let's get into it. So why don't we start with having you tell my listeners, uh, just a little ba bit of a background, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, like Cody, I know you started real young, so I'd love to hear, I'd love you to articulate that a little bit. And and Christian, you've got a very interesting background as well. So please take it away, guys. Yeah. So my name's Cody and I got started in real estate at 19 years old. I had been messaged on Facebook by someone I didn't know to drop out of college and get my real estate license. So I did what any rational teenager would do. And I did that. And I took someone's <laughs> random advice, but um, my parents weren't happy about that. So I ended up getting my my license, left college. I was about two quarters in a college at a community college in Tacoma at the time. And when I transitioned, I thought I was going to make a ton of money because this person online told me, you can get rich as a real estate agent and you can make a ton of money and then you can buy assets. Well, six months in, I made no money. And then the following 30 days after that, I uh, I made $3,600. So all that time. I had a little bit of money, and two months following that, I bought my first 12-plex, seller finance, zero money down. Good for you. Good for you. You know, it's funny. I, I want to interrupt for a second. I got my real estate broker's license right when I turned 18, which you could do back then with education. They got smart. Now you need some experience. But I was actually a broker. I could have my own office. I was smart enough to go work for another broker. My first year, I made eight grand. My second year, I made 10 grand. But my third year, I made over $100,000, which back wow. in 19, 1980 was pretty decent money. And, and it was all about mindset. I talk about this a lot. It was, that, that was the difference between year two and year three was mindset. So uh, I want to circle back to, well, actually, please continue. So you bought your first 12 plex. Are you finished there or or uh, you want to continue on that? Uh, yeah, I'll just segue a little bit off that. Nine months later, bought my second 12 plex, zero money down seller finance. Then I bought a oh. six plex and that's where I met Christian. Okay. Yep, then I went in the more traditional route. So mm -hmm. I bought into the like, okay, I need to get a high paying job so I can afford to buy assets. So I went to college, did my four years there. Uh, it took a couple of years bouncing around different sales jobs because uh, I didn't know what to do with a college degree. So sold pet food, sold apparel, uh, wanted to get in real estate and started working for lands.com. I'll, I'll get into this more, I'm sure, through the podcast. But one of the things that I learned really early on was... Uh, if you want to be a real estate investor, you do in fact have to buy real estate. Uh, being working in real estate is not the same thing as buying real estate. But worked at lands.com uh, that was bought by CoStar Group and spent the next four years selling LoopNet and CoStar to buy my personal residence, my house, and two duplexes. And at that point, seven years out of college, I had three properties and I was out of money again. And that's around the time that duplex was across the street from that sixplex Cody mentioned. Mm. And I was like, I want to get 30 units by 30. I'm 29 years old. And then this kid across the street has 30 units and has no money. I'm like, okay. Punk. That punk. Yeah, we, gotta, <laughs> we got it. We got to figure this out. And so that's, um, I had articulated that to Cody. I'm like, I want to get to 30 units by 30. You got to 30 units by uh, you were what, 21 when you hit 30 units? Yeah. And so at the time, I was like, well, shoot, you're not very close. <laughs> so I go on the MLS and I find this listing, 38 rental apartments on the market since I was eight years old. It had been on the market for 13 years at the time. It listed for $2 million when the rents were 300. Now we're getting like 1150 on the rents and we bought it for that same $2 million. No <laughs> kidding. Oh, guys. That is a massive clue, okay? Was it on LoopNet or where was it? That was just sitting on the MLS. Okay, guys, if you see a listing that's been there forever, 
you know, and, and, and very often they don't have a lot of information. Those are, those are the best because everybody no gives up at that point. Nobody goes any deeper because they're lazy. If you're willing to do what others aren't willing to do, you'll always be a success. And, and 13 years, holy crap, that is just incredible. And, and uh, yeah, so again, that's the other piece of that. If you see a listing that's been on the market a long time, the rents have gone up everywhere. So now, of course, they're stabilizing and compressing a little bit right now, but but they still, I mean, in many markets went up 20% or more in one year. So if you see one that's three or four years old and, and they're marketing it based on those rents, get excited, guys, get excited. <laughs> and, and I want to circle back to one other thing you said, Cody, um, which was um, you got your real estate license. I get this all the time. Should I get my real estate license to go buy real estate? And I always say no. Why? Yeah. Because first of all, you're not going to learn a damn thing about buying real estate. And nope. You're only going to learn how to protect homeowners and learn the laws. And you're held to a higher standard. You, you get a, you get you you basically have liability you don't need. So, and you got you agree with me? Yeah, absolutely. Quick yeah. to be real estate investors to buy real estate. Uh, that, there you go. You there that you go. Is next so, step. Yeah. So so uh, fascinating, guys. Well, listen, I want to circle back to that first seller finance deal. Yep. Because, you know, we again, we don't talk about seller finance much here. I talk about it in my boot camp quite a bit and strategies around it and how to market for them and how to sell them on it and so on and so forth. But first of all, how'd you find the deal? And 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 maybe it's the same model used for finding all your deals. I'm I'm assuming were they direct to seller or were they listed? This one was listed. Listed. Wow. Wow. And for context, this was two years before I met Christian, because I've been doing okay. this for about four years now. Mm -hmm. But I bought this 12 plex back in 2019. It was on the MLS. And I didn't even know where the heck this city was. It's called Quincy, Washington. Tiny right. little speck on the map that is 10 miles north of the freeway. It ended up being a great area, but I mean, it's just hard to find. Hmm. And originally there was another broker in the office, had a client that was under contract on a seller finance 22 unit in Moses Lake. It was a fourplex, a sixplex, and a 12. And that's the first time I learned about seller financing. Um, but when I realized that someone could buy something without any money, I, I tried to buy that deal and get it from that client because they didn't move forward. And that didn't work out. So I looked up seller financing and this 12 plex popped up. On the it, was all, it was actually listed offering seller financing. You didn't even yep. have to propose it. Wow. Okay. It was on the market for 551 days. And so I called the agent. I said, hey, I had a 22 unit just fall apart. It wasn't my deal that fell apart. It happened to be someone else's. That's all right. Deal. That's all right. That, see, now, why'd he do that, guys? That gives him instant social cred. Okay. So the broker took him seriously. Keep going. That's awesome. Yeah. So I let him know 22 units fell apart in Moses Lake, which is just next to Quincy. Mm -hmm. and that I wanted to buy this. So I asked him, how do you want it written up? I wrote it up. And what ended up having uh, been negotiated was 90% LTV seller financing. Wow. 30 year term, 6% interest, fixed rate, no balloon. So it was like a home home loan. It was a great deal. Problem was I had to come up with 10%. So many, many, many pitches later, I'd gone into the brokerage. and was like, hey, who has clients with money? And people ended up Letting me pitch them, and I botched most of them. First one, I didn't even uh, remember how much money I needed, how long I needed it for, with the payment. And I'm a math guy, so forgetting numbers is embarrassing. But um, botched a lot of pitches, got one, and the end all be all pitch was look, it's a 30 year fixed rate product. If I fail to pay you back, we'll just do a sign over the deed in lieu of a foreclosure, and you could take a fixed rate asset that you can't get the loan product for anywhere. Cash flow is great. They looked at the numbers. And so they placed a second lien with the mutual understanding that I would sign over the LLC had I not been back. Yeah, you just you secured the LLC as per, as performance. So so you guys, there's a lot of ways you can secure a deal. You can put, you know, have them put a note and mortgage on a second mortgage on the deal or second trust deal deed, depending on what state you're in. But you see, you can actually secure your interest in the LLC that owns the property, your membership interest, which is a basically a a, a direct foreclosure. I mean, they don't have to go through the foreclosure process. It's it's seamless. Uh, it's cleaner. It's easier, and it's safer for the person loaning the money. Well, listen. I just have to say this, you know, don't tell me you're too young to do this freaking business. I don't even want to hear it, okay? Because Cody has obviously proven that wrong. And if you're listening to this, I can tell you he looks 
like he's 20, 21 years old. Okay. So, you know, even if you look young, it doesn't freaking matter. Okay. So, so, um, you know, and, and, and the thing that's interesting is you didn't know what you didn't know. You just freaking did it. And that's my favorite catchphrase, massive freaking action. Okay. And you just took massive action and you, and you made it happen. Very impressive, brother. Very impressive. And I'm not easily impressed. So that's, that's absolutely awesome. So you, you got into that thing, literally nothing down because you, 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 you got uh, the down payment from somebody and I'm sure you gave them some rate of return. What, what, talk about that deal. What'd you give them? That was 12%. 12%. Okay. That's high. Well, that's good money. Well, so, it was expensive, but it would have cost more not to do the deal. And it cash flow, you can pay them 12. So that's where it worked out. Are you working? To, can you accelerate paying them back from cash flow and get try to get that paid back quicker? Or what's the plan? To, yeah. So I, in that deal, I had to just write a check. So I couldn't chunk it down over time. Hmm. And I didn't have all the cash flow or the income to chunk it down. So what ended up happening is I asked for one year. I didn't earn enough money to pay them off. So I begged and pleaded them to extend one more year. They said, yes, I had to pay a few more points. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was able to pay it out of earned income after that. And you months. paid it off from earned income. So so were they were they actually a hard money lender that you met at a meetup or something? Just a private individual. Private individual, because that's pretty sophisticated. They got points. They charge 12%. It sounds like hard money. That's why I asked. Okay. It was expensive, right. but yeah. it, it got me started. Right. And you could, you know, very possibly have refinanced it at some point and gotten them out of there too. But, you know, the rates have gone up. Huh? I, I wish. wish. I yeah. I, uh, well, you've, got, you've got a great first mortgage there. So it's like, you know, paying them off, paying off that second is just fine too. So talk to me about the, uh, what was the big one you guys got? There was a 38? We started our first deal was a 38 plex. Mm -hmm. Talk about Talk fall. about that. Talk about that a little bit. So yeah, $2 million purchase, seller finance, 15% down. So a $300,000 Wow. Capital raise. So that, that's the one you were just talking about that had rents that were freaking 10 years old, 11 years old, whatever. Uh, or 20, 30 years old. Yeah, right un now. unbelievable. So yeah, we're, we're in Washington State and uh, rents on some of those units were 350 bucks. On the, now, on the you have, you, now you're a blue state. Do you have rent control? Uh, not yet. We okay. will. <laughs> okay. actually, we wouldn't have bought the deal if there was rent control. You're right. Okay. Yeah, uh, percentage points at a time would never happen. Yeah, that would take that would take literally forever. Um, okay. But yeah, the building, so no one else wanted to buy this. That's why it was on the market for 13 years at the exact same price. A uh, lot of problems with the building, but their biggest problems were they were just not collecting rent. They filled the building with a whole bunch of their family members, a uh, bunch of drug problems. It was a rough building. Um, however, this is in 2021. There's a million relief programs for people not paying rent. So we got in there and we knew our plan was, okay, we're going to get in. We need to just get collections up. Before we do anything, we just have to start collecting money on people who aren't making any money. So we went door to door, got everyone on government programs, fixed the immediate issues, a little bit of work to the septic, a little bit of work to the plumbing. And we got the income on that building. 38 units were making five and a half grand. Day on one. That was gross. So it was a negative cap rate on acquisition. People say there's no such thing as a negative cap, but if it loses money operating <laughs> mathematically, Negative one cap, but we got collections from five and a half to 15,000 in the first few months. And part of that deal, we just negotiated, it's creative finance, it's whatever you negotiate. So we did lower payments for the first six months, and then the payments jumped up to the full amount. So we had time to- To get things cleaned up. Wall. Yep, so, exactly. So, so you worked with the existing tenants to get them on their feet rather than throwing them out. Yep. Absolutely. And what we found is when we went in, this is not something you talked about. Way, by the way, guys, that's unusual. Typically, operators will get them the hell out and get somebody else in that's paying and 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 get a higher rent and all that. So that speaks to you guys. I mean, that's really cool that you did it that way, but that is unusual. I'm just going to tell you. So, Well, our thing is cash management is everything. While mm -hmm. we could go get a higher rent, the we need to manage what we have and where we want to go because if we focus too much on where we want to go, we won't have anything. We want to, <laughs> where we focus, we tend to gravitate towards. So getting the higher rents in the future is great, but we have to manage the cash flow that we've got. So it's easier for us to go in and say, hey, we're going to buy you all new appliances. And we did that for a lot of people because all their appliances were busted. Go figure. Yep. Put a little bit of energy in and then ask for a little bit back. Now, it's not well, that that's how it works. I mean, that's how it works. I mean, you know, if you take over a property, the first thing you do is start making improvements on the outside. So people see you're going to improve it before you ask for any increase in rents.
So I know one of the things that we wanted to talk about before we started recording was partnerships. And it's a topic, you know, that's an important topic because this business really is a team sport. You guys became partners. It looks like you're great partners. Um, let's speak to that a little bit. Give me, give me your, give me your feedback on partnerships. Yeah, well, we, we bonded over going to a, a 10X growth conference and I think it was 2020. Oh, that's so funny. I'm going on Monday. I'm going I'll to see. Vegas on Monday. We'll see you there. You're going to be there? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Now, listen to this. Listen to this. I am in section one, row one, seat one. I'm in the front row, but I paid a lot of money for that. But but I'm literally in seat <laughs> one, section one, row one. It's funny. Anyway, it's just uh, the guy The guy called me and said, hey, guess what seat you got? But, uh, well, that's awesome. Make sure you come up and say hello. Yeah, uh, well. yeah I, I've never gone. I, I felt like I little, needed a little motivation. I motivate everybody else, and it's like time to look in the mirror. So, you know, Grant's hilarious. He's been on this show twice. And, and uh, you know, so I said, what the hell? I'll go. See. I saw Tony Robbins three weeks ago. I'm seeing Grant next week. Anyway, oh, I, di- I digress. So you went to GrowthCon. Please continue. Yeah, I went to GrowthCon. We sat down and, and looked at our goals because he had just bought that second duplex next to my mm-hmm. sixplex. Mm-hmm. And we got motivated, as most people do, leaving that event. They get, you know, there's a lot of hype in that room. We sure. sat down we're going to buy 100 units in two years or less without syndicating. And then we did in 11 months. But what we found for the ability to do our partnership is we had a similar place that we were going. And once we realized where we were going and what the costs were associated with those goals, we set out principles. And the principles were like our, our guiding bumpers down the, the bowling alley. Like that kept us in check so we don't go off the rail. So we established about 35 principles. <laughs> and um, that was not just sitting down and saying, we got to follow this, this, and this, but we've mapped that out over a partnership. All right. All right. I'm not, I'm not going to let that slide by. I want to hear some of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one don't, of them. don't add steps. Yep. Uh, you have to acknowledge that you can't do a good deal with a bad partner. So that'll mm-hmm. violate everything. You have to start mm-hmm. with profitability. Okay. Like, like you got to actually go catch a fish before you're dedicated to building a boat, right? Because you spend a whole bunch of time and resources on something that doesn't make money. You think Busy work, money. busy work. I, I get calls from my students. What do you think of this logo? I'm like, how many brokers have you called today? Okay. How many deals have you looked at? I don't want to hear about your freaking logo. Go out there and make something yeah. happen. <laughs> so it's called it's called income generating activity, right? All right. Anyway, sorry. Keep going. No, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Just stuff like that. And we just identify, okay, we have to keep it super simple. Mm -hmm. And we just identified all our little steps. And there were from things that we learned from other people to do and things not to do. We had a mentor who Mm -hmm. showed us exactly what not to do in business. Which was super helpful. I'm grateful for those. I'm a a great poster child for that as well. Actually, at my my boot camps, I give away these shirts that say, hashtag, ask me how I know. Because I'll say, don't freaking do that. Ask me how I know. And student gave me a shirt that said that. And finally, I'm like, so have, have a bunch of those printed up so we can give them out. That's funny. Do you guys wear different hats or are you doing the same thing? How are you? Yeah, so, what, what, tell, tell me about each of your strengths and how that plays out as well, please. Yeah. So there, there's two major roles that we play. And there's the, I'm typically the integrator and Cody is the, uh, what's the term? Visionary. Word? Visionary. There we go. Interesting. Oh, so, that's good. So you you're, you execute Christian. Cody, Cody, Cody visualizes and, and yet I can hear that in just talking to you guys. So, so you're more detailed, Christian, would that be an accurate statement? Yes. So okay. with Cody, Cody's the best single buyer of real estate I've ever met. He's, he's a freak of nature of putting together deals, building relationships. If it's some of the little stuff in between there of like, oh yeah, do we, uh, do we call about utilities yet? It probably hasn't happened. Uh, so with the little stuff of like what goes into running a property management company uh-huh. to the acquisitions, making sure we don't miss any steps. Where oh, so you're managing, stop. you're managing yourself. Yep. yep. Do you have an employee uh, or, or are you doing it yourselves? Yeah, yeah we got, uh, we got between the orgs, we have about 16 employees now. Holy which is shit. A, a wow. lot of that's the resort though. The resort. Okay. Okay. Staff. Have you guys, imp- have you guys implemented EOS? Uh, we ha- I read uh, the book Traction, so you know, that's right. how I got. Uh, you, I got that's why I, I heard the term implementer, and that's why I thought maybe had, that the, guys that is a game changer. I'd highly encourage you to implement it. It's incredibly powerful, guys. If you're listening, it's from the book Traction, a guy named Gino Wickman, and I I presented this to my mastermind members. You know, there's 16 billion in assets in my mastermind. This is my not the warriors. This is my mastermind uh, called the multifamily boardroom, and 
and and almost every single one of them uses it now and it's an absolute game changer so with that many people i'd highly encourage you to 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 implement it because it's it's uh it's very very powerful well good for yeah. you guys holy cow well listen by the way as it relates to partnerships um, guys, I have a free resource. If you haven't heard me talk about this before, see, partnerships are easy to get into, like a marriage, and hard to get out of. And like in my boardroom, I have two very large members at 4,000 plus doors apiece that just broke up, one a male and one a female, just broke up very large partnerships because they didn't ask the hard questions up front. Now, you guys, it was really cool. You came up with your 35 core principles. And that's that's a fantastic framework. And the other thing is that you both have complementary skill sets. You're not the same thing. If you're the same thing, you're going to butt heads. And but I've got a list of questions. Um, and guys, if you're listening, if you go to rodslinks.com, rodslinks, rods plural, links plural dot com, or text the word links to 72345. There's a book in there called The Questions You Should Ask Before Forming a Partnership. And it's all the hard questions you want to ask. Um you know, things like, you know, what happens if somebody gets sick or dies? You know, uh, uh, um, I can't even think of the questions, but there, there's a ton of them in there. And then they're the important questions to ask before you get going, because you get caught up in the emotion and you don't ask what you really should ask. And then if I if you hadn't heard me say this before, also trust your intuition. It's super important. If your gut doesn't feel right, trust it, because your brain is incredibly powerful and it can pick up on these little micro nuances that you're not consciously aware of, but your gut, you'll feel it. Okay. You know, there's a book called Blink and it talks about how instantly people can get a perception of something. And there's an example in there of some of the best art experts in the world. And they'll look at a painting and they don't know why it's fake, but they know it's fake. And that's, this is an example of it. Your brain can pick up on somebody's congruency, for example, if what they're saying matches their body language and things like that, but you're not consciously aware of it. Anyway, I digress, but that's uh, uh, partnerships. This business is a team sport and uh, you're very rarely going to do it alone. I've, I've only met literally one or two people that have built big, big portfolios on their own. And, um, and so, you know, these important upfront questions are super important. I love the fact you came up with some core principles. You know, uh, we've got core values in my organization as well, you know, things like integrity and things of that nature. That's the fact that's our number one core value. But, uh, well, let me ask you guys this. So what's the driver here, man? What's the why that's driving you to? And I'm well, sure it's different for each of you. Hmm? Yeah. When we got started, actually fairly, fairly similar. Um, they're, they're at least adjacent uh, goals. My goal was to retire my wife. She's a teacher in the school cool. district here. We're in a, a state where the, the politics have gotten weird. I won't go into that, but it's yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, not, uh, we'll, we'll say less than ideal, not agreeable. Yeah. Um, that, that was really my driver from going from, I have two duplexes to I got to stop buying duplexes and I have to go bigger because it went from, uh, hey, I have these dreams to like, we got to do this now. So there's the security of providing for my family. And I, I think a lot of husbands will relate to that. I'm like, you know, sure. I just want to provide for my wife. Sure. And Doing that meant financial freedom. It meant not buying one duplex at a time. I had to figure out how to go bigger, which is where my goal of let's get a partnership to 100 units went. For Cody, right. yeah, I wanted to be able to help retire my mom. And so I didn't oh, know what that exactly true. looked like in the beginning. Originally, I thought it was just going to be paying for a mortgage. But mm -hmm. what I realized is that things cost more than they used to, evident by uh, all the money that's been printed and now all the prices are higher, but um, so what I'm doing is I'm helping her remodel her house into a duplex and this is in North End Tacoma. So I had to figure out, okay, what's the value and how, what's it actually cost to be able to do all that. And it was about the same cost as retiring his wife. So we just said, Hey, hundred units, will do it. And when we got to hundred units in 11 months without syndicating, it was all just private seller finance debt. We celebrated by buying the resort. By, and, and you bought, okay, talk, talk about the, okay. Bought a resort. Good God, where where I, where the heck did that come from? And and it, talk about the resort. It came from YouTube. One of our okay. YouTube buddies uh, who's who's local, but he looked at this resort and he was just about to retire. His whole brand is investing the lazy way. He does fourplexes, buys one at a time, a lot of house hacking, but he just does a very passive, simple, build your wealth over time model. He looked at the resort and was like, "This thing makes a lot of money. It's also a ton of work." This is a better project for some young guys. So he called us and the uh, the pitch was, hey, I have an off-market deal. Uh, I just drove to it for the first time. The owners are really nice. Uh, zero down. And it's going to cash flow really nicely for you guys. Yeah, it's going to cash 20 grand a month on zero down. And 20 grand a month on zero down. Holy cow. So 
sounded great. And then we ended up meeting up with the owner, realized it was listed on the market and they wanted a million down. So they got the first zero of many correct for the down payment. They just forgot the one. <laughs> but a million dollars later, it did in fact day one cash flow 20 grand a month with another 30,000 a month upside. So it, it can be a really solid. So you did come up with a million down. Yep. yep. It was one coffee meeting, one relationship, one wire. We thought it was going to be the capital raise. We thought it was going to be three equity partners with the buyout agreement on our first pitch five minutes in. They're like, we just want to do this project. So what would it look like to not bring in other people? It's like, well, you'd need to bring the whole million. And it's like, okay, done. <laughs> that was the easiest so, raise. So hold had. on. I want to drill down on this a little bit just to give my uh, peeps some um, some framework. So, yep. so this is a resort that people go and stay in for a week or a few days or something like that. Yes? Yep. And it's been and you had and you that. had and what what's the appeal of this place? Is it on on water or something or what? What's up with it's it? Got, it's got waterfront and it okay. was built by John Beckman. And for us, the story's worth more than the real estate. John Beckman was a set designer for the Robin Hood movie that partnered with Walt back in the '30s. It was hmm. built by John, and so the Robin Hood Resort was built by John. So it's called the Robin Hood Resort. Robin hmm. Hood Village Resort, yeah. And How so many rooms? Called- on that campus, there's 17, okay. with an extra guest apartment. And then we bought the neighboring property seller financed as well when it hit the market. So that was added another three. Okay. So you got basically 20 rooms between the two properties mm-hmm. and, and it cash flows well. Um, yep. and, and you looked at historical numbers to come up with the determination that it would cash flow. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Wow. And they sell or financed. And, and, and what do you have to give? Did you, uh, did you give your, uh, I mean, if you can't answer, this is fine. Did you give your limited partner or your partner in the deal? Did he get equity or did he get a return? We did equity with okay. a fixed buyout. They did not want to have any cash flow. They just wanted to have their percentage and then to be bought out later, but to be backed by. Wow. Well, that's, that's basically debt. I mean, let's just, just to be honest, oh, yeah, with you, yeah. that's, it's that's debt. debt. It, it looks it, like it, equity, but it's not. They have equity right. from a from a from a, a collateral standpoint or from a security standpoint, but that's really debt. When you, and by the way, yeah, guys, if you if you give somebody a rate of return, like let's say you t- give them a preferred rate of say eight to ten percent or something, but then you cap them at twelve percent, that's debt, okay? Because you're basically going to pay twelve percent to get them out of there, because anything over the twelve percent is return of capital instead of a return on capital. Love it. Exactly love right. It. And and for them, there's some tax advantages for them the way they wanted to play the equity piece, um, which was the main reason we structured with the equity piece is just because we're running a cost segregation study on it. it made sense for them the way they wanted to run it. But outside of that, it, it is effectively, we run most of our equity partnerships very similar to debt, where if we partner with someone, there is going to be a fixed buyout in a fixed period of time. We will own everything we buy and the real estate will pay for it. The goal is the real estate buys the real estate. Yeah, that's that's the that's the best. Have you seen a slowdown at your resort based on the current economic environment? No, not yet. Okay, well, let's hope not. Okay, talk about any aha moments that you had on this journey, guys. Any epiphanies where you're like, okay, now I get it. Moments, if any have come to mind. It yeah, it clicked for me when I got my first bank loan. My first bank loan was a million nine and a quarter. And when we got that, I had to sign and I had to have the net worth personally to back that. And I did, but it it didn't get real until got that first loan. How how old were you when you got that loan? 22. Wow. Now, did you have a relationship with that bank beforehand? Nope. I didn't even know they existed. Wow. 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 That is extraordinary. Honestly, again, uh, very impressed. Okay. But that's when it sobered you up a little bit, didn't it? It it was pretty cool because the ability to sign and back a million nine loan at 22 was like, hmm, that's- Don't that's get valid. cocky. Don't get cocky because that oh. can come back and bite your ass if you're not careful. Oh, ask, me, ask me how I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. But we, we try and just keep conservative and we have a four stage business cycle. We didn't really talk about this, but it, it works alongside with the partnership. We have build phase- stabilization phase, optimization, and then debt hammer. We're not going to get to be the biggest players in the real estate holding space, mm-hmm. but we will own everything in cash. Mm-hmm. And it'll, we're going to get it to be hundreds of millions of dollars, I I think, in the next 10 years, and then it'll take another 
five to 10 after that to actually pay it off. But we so have our a great, business. great strategy, Cody. Great strategy. Yeah. Uh, really, really, really great strategy. Um, yeah. I, you know, and, and, and I shouldn't, I should do some of this myself. I, I had a partner way back. We're talking when I was your age, actually in Denver and, uh, and his strategy was he'd buy six places, he'd sell three, pay off the other three. Then he'd go buy more and sell and pay off, you know, and 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 there's nothing stronger than free and clear real estate. It just doesn't get any better than that. So this is a, that's that's really good strategies. Um, let's see. I felt like there was something else we wanted to talk about. What else didn't I ask you guys about? Forgive me. We went off a whole bunch of different ways. It's been really valuable. But let me ask you this. You know, I have a lot of aspiring real estate investors on this podcast. We just broke 15 million downloads. We're the largest in the world, uh, what we do. And wow. Yeah. Thank you. And, and thank you. And so, you know, we got a lot of people that want to be where you're at, want to make something happen. I dare I say, want to get off their butts and go make something happen. And so what advice would you have for somebody that feels trapped? Maybe they're caught up in fear or they've got some limiting beliefs, like I'm not smart enough or analytical enough. That was one of mine or, or you know, whatever, uh, you know, or, or maybe they're comfortable. And we know the comfort zone's a nice warm place. We also know nothing freaking grows there, right? So what advice would you have for someone like that that hasn't pulled the trigger? What would you tell them to do? Well, we mentioned a little earlier, there's the, you know, if you want to be a real estate investor, you, you do in fact have to buy real estate. And you watch people buy real estate. And as soon as they get that first deal done, the second, third, fourth, fifth deal happen right after that. Like, I, I see it all the time. I, I see it with my students. They're like, it's that law of the first deal there. That's like, it takes the longest. It's the scariest. It's the most stressful. It might be eight months in They're bitching. I haven't got a deal yet. And then they get one. Next thing I know, they've got four or five. It's like, it happens every freaking time. It's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's no, funny. It, goes, it, it goes very fast once you get started, but you do in fact have to get started. The easiest way I have found to actually get into the game, and this might be a little bit unique to Cody, my strategy, but it's, you have to set your goal and you have to believe in that goal. If you don't have any significance behind it, you're not going to do it. it what what do you mean by significance? It. What do you mean by significance so, behind it? We have a, we have a circle drill. And okay. Speak, speak up, buddy. I can't hear you. We've got a circle drill where we've mapped out. Um, yeah, that might be a mic. We've uh, we've mapped out a few things that build relationships with folks and get deals done. You've got relatability, which is your past, and people will meet with you based on relatable points. That, that that's that, called building rapport. That's called building yep. rapport. Okay, relatability. Got it. Yeah, it, it builds that initial meeting, but you get to the meeting, and then in the second sector, you have goals, and people will work with you based on the goals that you set if they mm -hmm. align with them. But most people get to the meeting and then they keep trying to share relatable points. That's not how you build the relationship. That's how you book the relationship. Like you book that initial meeting. So you share goals, get people to work with you. The significance is what changes when you actually get there. It's not your why. This is where we defer from most people. We, we think a why is good to internalize. But as far as actually connecting with others, it's the what changed when you hit your goal. And what changes for us when we hit our goal, because that change is what will get people to buy into your story. And so with the uh, whole outreach thing, when we talk about significance, it's like, okay, what's going to change if this happens? And that's how we've gotten all our deals. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So you look at the end, you look at the end result and, and you are, you communicate that end result. I like it. Oh, I like it a lot. Yeah. And uh, by the way, guys, a, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Please continue. And then I'll go tell ahead. what I say, what I want to say. I was say, just tying it back to how you get to your first deal and how you actually close that. Once mm -hmm. you've identified that goal and you've mapped that out for yourself, the next step, and this is really the last thing you do, is you just find the people in your market who've done what you want to do and you just network with them. And you that's figure it. out what was the next step and you just listen to them. And that's, that's it. it. That's it. I, and that's why my warriors are so successful. I, I, you know, those are my mentorship students. They own upwards of 150,000 units now that we know of. And I've only been doing this five years. And it's it's by that association. My most successful students, my most successful warriors are the ones that are most connected in the warrior community. And by the way, on that note, that's what I was going to say. So these guys, if you ever watch, if you watch this on YouTube, you're going to see a sword between them on the wall. And I and I and I was freaking out because I thought I screwed up because, you know, I've got 1400 students. 
And so I'm looking at my phone thinking, God, are they my students? Because we give a sword like that with somebody's first deal. Then they become what we call a warrior of the sword. And I thought I screwed up. I'm like, oh, shit. I, I, and so I'm looking at my phone to see if I had them in my phone. But uh, anyway, uh, it was kind of funny because the sword they've got behind them is exactly the same sword that we give. It looks exactly the same uh, that we give our students. It's just hilarious. So do you have any favorite quotes, guys, anything, any, any, or any favorite authors that, that juice you, that, that have inspired you? Talk about that for a second. Yeah. So as far as uh, good content that helped me get started, Deals on Wheels by Lonnie Scruggs. Oh, is, wow. That's an old, that's an old one. That's been around forever. Wow. Yeah. So when I first read that, I was like, these are great ideas. And everyone told me they were outdated and then I used them and it worked. Hmm. So <laughs> uh, it was amazing, but mm -hmm. deals on wheels. And then Carlton sheets has an audio book. Wow. This is old stuff, man. This is really kind of, kind of funny because you're so young and you're talking about stuff that's been around for 40 freaking years. Wow. Well, first time I was driving back and forth from Tacoma to Moses Lake going over the past, I was driving in a 1991 Miata. That's the, the project <laughs> car I had through high school that I got for 800 bucks. So I'd be driving this car until it actually blew up. And, and did somebody leave those tapes in it or something? Is that how you found them? So my original real estate brokerage that I was at, they had this audio book. And since I was going on a drive, I told the DB, I was like, is there anything I should listen to? And he gave it to me. And he's like, listen wow. to this. He, he He's, I mean, literally, I'm not kidding. I mean, Carlton Sheets was around when I was... 15 years old and I'm 63. Okay. So just to give you an idea what we're talking about here. And, and of course, Lonnie Scruggs, I, I, that's probably 30 years old as well. Uh, that's uh, the deals on wheels is mobile home park, uh, mobile home yep. stuff, but the strategies work, you know, well, that's interesting. How about you, Christian, anything for you? Um, I have a few on uh, the mindset side. I, I love the the ten X book that Grant oh, yeah, sure. put out. Sure. It's just a great one on mindset. It, that one sure. got, got me amped, got me motivated. Um, and then as far as actual sales skills, I love uh, Chris Voss's book. Oh, yeah. I've had him Never on the split show. The Never Split the Difference. He's he's yeah. the FBI hostage negotiator. Guys, if, if you want to list, I actually had him speak to my mastermind as well. If you ever want to learn about negotiation, he's get that book. It's a fantastic book uh, about negotiation. I love it. Well, listen, guys, I got to cut it off here. It's been a real treat to meet you guys. Very, very impressed uh, uh, with you both. And uh and keep keep up the good work. And you know, when you uh when you hit that goal, um, uh, make sure you reach back out to me, get your butt back on my show, will you? Because it would be awesome to circle back to this and say, Hey, this is what they said, and this is where they're at. Cause I know you're gonna hit it. It's no it's just a decision. When you make a declaration like that, it's freaking done. There's no question. Pleasure to meet you guys and and uh good luck in, in all you do. Likewise. Thank you so much. All right, take care. So one other quick thing. We encounter so many people that are frankly frustrated. You know, they're looking in the mirror and they're frustrated that they haven't been able to escape the rat race. They haven't been able to build cash flow to the point where they're able to have financial and time freedom with their families. You know, and maybe they see other people buying real estate and creating, you know, incredible cash flow. And they think, well, it's just scary. You know, buying apartments is intimidating. And I get it. But see, that's why we created our Warrior Mentorship Program. They're our coaching students and they've had extraordinary results. My students, I've been teaching about five years and they own upwards of 140,000 units now that we know of, right? And we feel like it's just getting going. Now we're looking to grow this group and really take it to the next level. And honestly believe that the greatest transfer of wealth could be upon us right now with this current economic environment. Everything's going on sale. So we're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework, really like a blueprint or a map, literally step by step. And then they're able to leverage our systems and our incredible network to raise money and equity, to find deals and close those deals and build partnerships really nationwide. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more in our incredible network and take advantage of the unbelievable opportunities that are upon us, you can apply to my Warrior Mentorship Program by texting the word CRUSH to 72345, or you can go to mentorwithrod.com. And what we'll do is we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out and see if it's a fit. Now, again, you can go to mentorwithrod.com or text the word CRUSH to 72345 to apply, and we will speak soon.